Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to you, one and all. Thank you very much for being here tonight, and I think you're going to hear some very good news. Now the microphone's going to get turned over to the great Bobby Roth, Vice President of the David Lynch Foundation, and he'll take it from here. I'll see you in a little bit later on. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend, Bobby Roth. Before we begin, I have to say that um, I've been doing this meditation for over 40 years, and it's helped me a lot in many, many different ways, but in particularly with giant's torture and uh, <laughs> recovering from 50-some years of disappointment, but last year was really great. And I grew up here, and it's wonderful to be back and uh, enjoy that respite of pain and torture. Um, <laughs> Now, if Buster would just recover, we'd be in good shape. Um, all kidding aside, um, recently the Surgeon General of the United States said that uh, if, if the American people are swimming in an ocean of stress, then our children are drowning in it. There are over 10 million children under the age of 12 on antidepressant medication. There's about 4.5 million children who've been diagnosed with ADHD. And the number three cause of death among teenagers in America is suicide. We have a very, very serious problem. And tonight, we want to investigate just transparently. We're just going to throw it out here for you all to consider what the David Lynch Foundation considers to be a very substantive solution. Traumatic stress and stress in general, uh, which some years ago could have been dismissed, oh, our kids are stressed, isn't that too bad? Now we know what stress and traumatic stress do. They undermine learning, they undermine health, they undermine relationships with families and communities. And for those few, relatively few children who have access to medication and talk therapy, then there is some benefit but there's an estimated 70% of all teenagers and children suffer from stress-related disorders, and they, are, they go undiagnosed and untreated. About six years ago, the great filmmaker and my dear friend David Lynch started a foundation, the David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education and World Peace, and its purpose was to bring an evidence-based approach of meditation to any child initially in America and then throughout the whole world who wanted to learn to meditate. And the meditation technique that David had been practicing for over 30 years was something called transcendental meditation. So that's what the foundation has done. And in the last six years, the foundation has provided scholarships for over 150,000 at-risk youth to learn to meditate throughout the United States, Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, Asia. And the most successful, most inspiring program, and we have so many people here to thank for that, has been here in the San Francisco Bay Area, in San Francisco. You're going to hear much on that tonight. The person I'd like to introduce now <clears throat> is a brilliant researcher and a uh, beautiful human being, and he's written a book which you're all going to receive as a gift from the David Lynch Foundation in your goodie bag called Transcendence, Healing and Transformation Through Transcendental Meditation, and it comes out tomorrow, his birthday, and uh, Dr. Rosenthal, as you, you'll hear, top psychiatrist, no, oh, you're going to hear from me, <laughs> Dr. Rosenthal is a glasses, is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown Medical School and has maintained a private practice in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area for more than 30 years. He conducted research at the National Institutes of Mental Health as a research fellow, researcher, and senior researcher for more than 20 years. 
It was there that he first described and diagnosed Seasonal Affective Disorder, SAD. Rosenthal has received the prestigious Anna Monica Foundation Prize for his contribution to research in treating depression and has been listed in the Best Doctors in America and the Consumers Research Council of America's Guide to America's Top Psychiatrists. He is the author of more than 200 scholarly articles as well as books for the general public including Winter Blues and the Emotional Revolution. Please join me in welcoming a very dear friend and a great spokesperson, and not spokesperson, a great voice of reason and investigation into the realm of meditation, consciousness, and health, Dr. Norman Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Bobby, and thank you all. It's a great privilege and honor to be here. And I must say, to me, uh, something of a surprise to be here talking about meditation, because I would not have guessed that four or five years ago when I was doing my research and seeing my patients and minding my own business as a private practitioner. But then uh, something amazing happened. You know, I've always been interested in everything my patients tell me. But sometimes somebody says something that really captures my researcher's imagination. And I hear it and I think I really must follow up on this. And that's what happened to me many years ago when one of my patients described how his moods changed predictably with the seasons. And my ears pricked up. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And from that, my team and I described seasonal affective disorder and we developed light therapy, exposing people to bright light. And at the time, it seemed very wacky to a lot of people, but it's now become a very mainstream treatment used all the world over. Now, a similar surprising thing happened to me about five years ago when a young man in my practice with bipolar disorder, who was on every sort of good treatment and was getting along okay told me, you know, I've just started to do something that has really made a huge difference. Now I am happy 90% of the time. I said, now what, what, what is that? He said, well, it's transcendental meditation. I said, oh, oh yeah, I know that. I did it you know, way back when, when the Beatles went to Marishi back. <laughs> I was in South Africa then, and I did it for in a couple of months, and then I was a medical student, so I stopped doing it. He said, you know, you should really get back to it, Dr. Rosenthal. <laughs> so I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking now, you know, where am I going to fit in 20 minutes twice a day? But he kept at me. And um, so I thought, you know, why don't I listen to this young man? Maybe he's got something to teach me. So I started to, you know, my friend Bob Roth refreshed my technique. And I started to meditate off and on. And he kept checking in on me, my patient, not Bobby. And he kept checking in on me and saying, you know, are you doing it? I said, yeah. He said, now, are you doing it regularly? I said, well, not really. He said, that's what's going to make the difference. So I did, and sure enough, within a couple of months, I experienced very profound changes in myself. You know, I was no longer rapidly irritated by all the ordinary insults and slights and inconveniences that happen on a daily basis. I, I suddenly, I became, gradually I should say, I became more uh, thoughtfully responsive rather than reflexively reactive. Now, I'd always been a reasonably organized person, but I became more so. Somehow my priorities fell into place, planning became easier, I became more effective, and I had nothing to attribute this to other than my meditation. So I thought, wow, you know, let me try it on some of my patients. And sure enough, for anxiety, for problems with alcohol abuse, for anger management problems, I saw people responding. I would refer them to the local TM center and they would respond. One dramatic example was a client of mine who is herself a brilliant psychologist, Yale-trained, married to a very nice guy who unfortunately had a rage problem. Little things would trigger him to have huge rage attacks, and they had tried everything. Several cognitive behavior therapists, including a multi-day treatment program, 
with little benefit. And so I sat them down, I explained the technique, I told them how they mustn't fix the tree leaf by leaf, but they must water it at the root, as my friend David Lynch explained to me. And sure enough, he started meditating, and after a while, according to my patient, who's a very trained observer, she said, this is an absolute game changer. Our marriage has completely changed. He no longer rages. Somehow a buffer has been built into his system. Well, the researcher in me kicked in, and I started applying for some grants, and I got a grant to study TM in bipolar patients, and a small grant for a pilot study for combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder. Incidentally, the paper on that pilot study just appeared today in military medicine. You can Google it later if you're interested. But the bottom line is, by the end of these studies, most of the clinicians in my group had gone and paid for their own treatment for TM. <laughs> They'd gotten their own TM treatment. They, they were so impressed with the results. So at that point, you know, I was so excited. I see it in my patients, I see it in myself, I see it in my research. I feel like I have to write a book on the subject. And I look in the literature, the research literature, and sure enough, there are hundreds of publications, many of them in very first-rate journals. And so the subject just captivated me, and the result is the book Transcendence that Bobby showed you, and you should each have one in your in your goodie bag to take home. And uh, so it's been, for me, a, a wonderful journey, and I feel incredibly blessed and grateful to have stumbled across this, this path. But I think, you know, the question really that arises in all of our minds is how can transcendental meditation be having so many diverse beneficial effects? And as Bob Roth mentioned, the answer lies in a single word and that word is stress. Because stress is everywhere. I see it in myself and in my patients. We see it in these school children who are having such difficulty in their lives, let alone in their studies. We see it on the evening news. We see poverty and unemployment, hurricanes and tornadoes, wars and illnesses. And I would venture to suggest that if you look in your own lives, you'll see stress in the people around you and in yourselves. So something we should know about stress is that it's not just unpleasant. Sure, it triggers and sustains anxiety, depression, insomnia, psychological problems that affect literally tens of millions of people, but it can actually literally kill. It causes diseases that can actually kill. And just to illustrate the point, I'd like to just show you a few slides from really my colleague, um, Dr. Robert Schneider, his brilliant work. This is a meta-analysis. So each bar that you see there represents a different kind of treatment. So you see right on the left the reduction in blood pressure induced by transcendental meditation. And look what a lowering of blood pressure it is compared to all the other stress management techniques. Uh, including the one on the right that actually makes the blood pressure worse. <laughs> so the point is, when you say, I'm going to get a stress management technique, just giving it that name doesn't actually mean that it does what it's supposed to do. TM has outperformed a lot of other treatment conditions. So I think not only is it beneficial, but it is specifically beneficial. Next slide, please. Here we have a cartoon of two arteries. The one on the left is nicely patent, and you can see it is going to conduct blood very well to the organs. The one on the right is affected with a very common illness, atherosclerosis, whereby cholesterol and, and inflammatory cells infiltrate the linings of the artery. And you can see it's narrowing that artery, and whatever organ is at the other end of that artery is in trouble. So if it's the heart, this person is in for a heart attack. If it's the brain, this person is in for a stroke. Not a pleasant illness kills one in three United States 
citizens and members of all developed countries. So let me just go right to the bottom line because time is limited. Next slide, please. This is the reduction in mortality in people who were in the various blood pressure studies. What you see here is mortality is decreased over the years in people over age 55, in people who've been randomized to uh, TM treatment versus their health education control. Over seven or eight years on average, those in the TM group will have had a reduction in mortality of more than 20% and cardiovascular mortality of about 30%. And this is in people where they didn't even know if these people kept meditating after the initial study. So it's a very impressive result. But the researchers didn't stop there. Next slide, please. They went on and replicated it with another prospective study where you see the reduced rates of death heart attack and stroke, um, where the difference between the TM, which is the blue, that's the percentage of people who had those three very severe outcomes on the right versus health education on the left. And you can see how many more people in the control health education treatment had these bad things happen to them. A total risk reduction of almost 50%. And this is in spite of the fact that all the people in all these groups had standard of care. They had their blood pressure lowering medicine, their cholesterol lowering medicine, all the usual things to help them. And yet TM added that much to the treatment outcome. So that is to me a stunning vindication of the potency of this technique. Um, I'm going to close there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like now to introduce our next speaker, an assistant superintendent of the San Francisco Unified Schools District, Nurjahan Kalik. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I want to tell you that I am in love with this program. The wellness and meditation program and quiet time is phenomenal for our students. You know, as a longtime educator and being in this field for a number of years, one of the challenges that our students face every day, they face drugs, poverty, they face the challenges of peer pressure, amongst other things and our students struggle to be successful in school. And as an educator, teachers and my fellow administrators struggle every day trying to find solutions to help our students be more successful in school. Well, one of the wonderful things that happened to me um, a couple of years ago, I actually went to Visitation Valley Middle School uh, under the supervision of uh, Principal Durkee, who I believe is an innovator in the field and a visionary to bring the Quiet Time program to San Francisco, to Visitation Valley Middle School. And one of the things that absolutely amazed me when I went to observe the program was a hundred of our students sitting in an auditorium. I mean, this bell rings, and they all sit silently, quietly, peacefully in their meditative state, and it was a sight to behold. It made me feel proud to be an educator because I can see that this was something that was seriously helping our students, and it was supporting them. And not just the students were meditating, but the staff as well. And um, a little later, um, uh, Principal Durkee will show you some statistics for, uh, for the school that are just out of this world, it's just out of sight. So what can I say about that? But, and in addition to that, 
Um, I also participated in the wellness and meditative uh, meditation program for administrators in San Francisco Unified. And I will tell you, it has helped me immensely in terms of clarity in my thinking, more focus. And as an administrator and an educator, you know, facing the daily challenges in my job, it has also helped me be successful and many of my colleagues that work with me in San Francisco Unified. So this is a program I can go on and on and talk about. But with, on that note, uh, I'd like to share a video with you right now so you can see some of the things I'm talking about, okay? I think that we have the most amazing kids. I love their energy and emotional intelligence. But what's different about these kids is that they need a lot more. Many of my students are in charge of taking care of their household, basically. Their parents work, and so they're in charge of their siblings. Or they work and help, you know, financially support their families. There are a lot of kids who live in neighborhoods that aren't so good, crime, addiction. They see things that I never even thought about when I was in high school. My last two years, I was locked up. Robbery, gang, things like that. There's different levels of stress that the students have. Um, some of it's environmental. Some of it is, is organic and chemical. There's definitely stress that students experience around school and anxiety um, around grades. I feel like I do have a lot of stress in my life. I was always getting truancy letters. I was never really in school. Our principal, Richard Duber, was the first to bring us the idea of uh, having a quiet time program. It was certainly for me a level of skepticism regarding whether we could really get students at this school to, to be willing to try and meditate it would allow them that time for themselves that they don't get. And something that actually releases the stress as opposed to time for themselves that would make them more stressed. We do it at the end of first period and at the end of seventh period, and the entire class gets quiet. Those students who want to meditate have that opportunity because we have an adult in the room who is making sure that they feel safe and comfortable. When I, when I had my first meditation, I felt so relaxed. You sit, you sit and like you, you, you just like let just loose relax. and relax. It's just you and your mind and going back and forth. Just you have to think this stuff out. Sometimes you just need that. I'm all tired and fatigued, but after quiet time, it just releases all the stress, helps you feel more energetic. I used to say, I'm going to get my grades up, I'm going to do better. But yeah, it was just what I said. It never happened until I started meditating. Because I got better grades, and like, I'm not really all that mad anymore. You felt so good and at peace, and you just felt like nothing like negative could get you. I feel like refreshed, like I'm, like I'm just full of energy, and I'm just ready to like continue on with my day. I think it gives them rest. I think that it gives them a sense of well-being and security and like independence. When I start meditating, like a week later, I start to change. And I'm not gonna change just like that, you feel me? You gotta, like, something gotta help me. I was just meditating a lot, like even Saturdays and Sundays. Before, it was like kinda hard to concentrate because I had a lot of like, problems in my life. I mean, I still do, but not like that. I think that it's, it's pretty amazing that kids have op an opportunity to experience this, especially at this phase in their life. Quiet Time has also helped with the community in the classroom. For example, my fifth period class, they were really rough at the beginning of the year. And now it's just turned into such a nice way to start the day. I just feel like I'm not alone. I have something with me that I can take, like to help me, keep me at peace and stuff like that.
meditation is awesome. I would love to see my students graduate from high school and go to college and learn to participate in the world in a way that is helpful and productive and fulfilling. In order for them to do that, they need love, they need education, they need support, and I think TM is a, is a part of that. What can I say? A, pe a picture speak a thousand words, and hey, that's the reason I come to work every day is to see those happy faces. That this has made such a difference in the lives of these children. Again, I love TM, and I love quiet time. So on that note, in summary, I better summarize, be quiet, and get off. And uh, I just want to take this moment to introduce the guru and the master of meditation, and that is our one and only Lauren Val Velasic. Sorry. Valisic. And let me tell you a little bit about Lauren, though. He's a very interesting man. You can tell he meditates a lot, very calm. You'll see when he comes out. But he, um, I'm telling, no, really, you'll, you'll see, you can feel it. But he, um, this man has had 30 years in business. He's been an entrepreneur. He's been a businessman, a researcher. And now he is the um, executive director of the Wellness and Meditation Center. He assures academic success for our students and even takes care of people like you and me, the wonderful Lauren. Come on out, Lauren. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you tonight. And what I'm going to do just for a few minutes is give you all an update on the experiment that we have embarked on about five years ago in the San Francisco Unified School District. When we first started the program five years ago, to be honest, I did not know if it would work. I had had experience teaching meditation to executives as a tool for leadership performance. I had had experience teaching meditation in health settings as a tool to reduce hypertension, and I had had some experience working with students in middle class schools uh, doing research project investigating meditation as a tool to reduce ADHD symptoms. And in the spring of 2007, I was invited to go and meet with Jim Durkee at Visitation Valley Middle School, and this was a different environment, and, and yet Jim, his, his nature is, he's a great innovator, and he's passionate about helping his students and helping his community. And he had looked at some of the research on meditation, and he wanted to explore the idea of offering a meditation program for his students. And so we embarked on a, a great journey and experiment together. We didn't know it would, if it would work because it was a totally different environment. I had a lot of experience doing research and teaching meditation and was very confident that it was an effective tool. But the question was, could meditation be used in a, an urban school, a very high stress urban school, a school that at the time had the uh, distinction of being known as the fight school. And it was a school that was rife with really high levels of tension for the students, the teachers, and the administrators. And so we weren't sure if it was gonna work, but we forged a collaboration with Jim and his staff and we iterated over a period of months and years now. And after five years, we are at a point in the development of this program where it has really become a very profound, successful core strategy for reducing stress in the school and structuring and encouraging and fostering a, an environment that the students can really engage in learning. And Along with the, the growth and the success at Visitation Valley, which really now is serving as a reference model for other schools, we have started to move into three other schools. We have been working at Everett Middle School for a few years, and this last year, as you saw in this video, we have moved into two high schools, Burton High School and John O'Connell High School. As we work in these schools, it really is a very moving, profound, inspiring experience to see the transformations. These transformations that you see in these videos are not isolated. We have now taught 
2,000 students in the San Francisco Unified School District how to meditate. We've taught over 350 teachers, admini school administrators, and central office administrators how to meditate. And these schools and these uh, administrators and these teachers are starting to embrace it as a core strategy for human development. And it's impacting the environments of their schools. And as we go through this process, we are working with the schools and also the research planning and accountability department in the school district to evaluate the program. We are doing psychological testing. We do surveys. We are looking at grades, attendance, and uh, other school factors like suspensions and uh, test scores. And what we're seeing, it's still early in the game for a new, uh, really a new kind of paradigm in the field of education. But now we are ag aggregating a lot of data, which is really indicating that there is profound impact. And <clears throat> so it's been an extraordinarily expiring journey. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce the principal of Visitation Valley, Jim Durkee, who will tell you more specifics about the results he's seen at his school. Um, but before we do that, I want to introduce another short video. And we're going to hear from Angie, who is a freshman at Burton High School. And she learned to meditate in the Quiet Time program um, at Burton this last year. I am 14 years old, and I go to school at Burton High. My life is a very hectic life. Like, I think I grew up too fast, you know. I have a lot of problems I have to deal with at home, so I raise myself and I had to raise my siblings. I grew up in like the projects in the ghetto in the area that you need to watch your back every day, you know, because next thing you know, next morning you might not be there. And you just go down and my neighborhood's right there. There's been so many drive-bys there too. It's crazy. I wake up every morning really stressed. Like the life that I grew up with gives you a headache every day, like every day. Like I have a headache right now, like it might not seem like it, but I do. I would get into a lot of fights and everything would piss me off really easily and I won't have no patience for nobody. The only thing that we used to calm me down was smoking weed. Smoking weed becomes a habit. I wanted to learn how to meditate because like, I thought it would help me. And then it did help me. Like, before I, like, I used to be high every morning to get me through my day, but I don't smoke weed anymore or anything, or drink or anything. I don't need to. Meditating has like, helped me say no. When I meditate, it, like, it helps me deal with it all. Before smoking used to help me deal with it all. Now meditating just relaxes me and I'm able to like think before I act or like think second about like the situation, what should I do on this, what should I do on that? Or before I used just to like snap like boom and then my action didn't come out that well when I used to smoke. It doesn't take your coolness away or anything either. You can meditate and still be the coolest person ever. But I'm still the coolest person ever, you know. I want to go to college. I want to play volleyball, basketball, soccer. And well, I want to go to college for criminal justice and deal with people like me, like that, done wrong stuff, and, and be a parole officer. I want to be known for being independent. I don't want to be known for something stupid. A gang member's niece or, or a gang member's daughter. I don't want to be known for that. What, what is that? Like, what is that going to get me? It's not gonna get me nowhere. I wanna be known because I did something great with my life. I am gonna keep on meditating. Like, I don't think it's something I give up. And, and now that we have over 15 schools in San Francisco and also in the East Bay requesting this program. And I think that's, that number is going to grow quickly. We uh, uh, are looking for more and more support to provide uh, this opportunity to students all over the Bay Area. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And over the last five years, I've had the, the uh, wonderful opportunity to get to know the principal of Visitation Valley Middle School, James Durkee. And it's really been uh, a great honor for me to get to know him and work with him. He, at first uh, glance, when I met Jim, um, 
he was on a ladder uh, replacing a light bulb, and I thought he was the janitor in the school. <laughs> and uh, I asked uh, the secretary, where is the principal? And she pointed up to uh, Jim on the ladder. And uh, he's a hands-on leader. He's an extraordinary leader. He's passionate about helping his students and also serving the community. He's a 40-year vet veteran educator and 2008 national principal National Middle School Principal of the Year. So let's please welcome Jim Durkee. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, I also do windows. <laughs> Before I begin my uh, remarks for the evening, I have a, a job I need to fulfill, and that is um, David on behalf of all of the students at Visitation Valley Middle School, I'm supposed to give you a shout out, so good going. <laughs> and David has come and, and meditated with the entire student body at one time in um, our auditorium. And for those of you that have never experienced middle school, it is the land of I love you, I hate you, I can't stand you, and I want to hold your hand all in five minutes. <laughs> and um, when people come and watch the kids meditate in the auditorium, they, they wonder what drug we're using. <laughs> and we're not. They're, we're using joyfulness, and we're, we're making our school a happy place in a very unhappy environment, and I would really, really like to just say thank you to everyone responsible for bringing quiet time to Visitation Valley. Visitation Valley Middle School, along with other urban middle schools in low-income neighborhoods, is the midst of a battle, a battle against the predictive power of demographics. Most of our students are on free or reduced lunch, Drugs, gangs, and violence are part of their everyday life. Many of our students have little or no parent oversight. Most everybody in our school is either related to someone who has been shot, who did the shooting, or who saw the shooting. As a result of these high stress conditions, our school and schools like ours have many predictable problems, low attendance, violence, low performance. This is such a common pattern in urban schools, it is almost an assumed outcome. Specifically, in our case, our students come from the zip codes 94124, which is the Bayview Hunters Point, and 94134, Visitation Valley. Education researchers believe that based on these zip codes, our students, their ethnicity, and the fact that few of their parents went to college, they can predict our students' attendance rate, behavior, test scores, and overall academic achievement. Historically, this was correct. In recent years, however, we have demonstrated that we can break the predictive power of demographics. Quiet Time is playing a key role in that break few. Could I have slide number one, please? Our attendance is trending up significantly. It is at 98.3% as of last fall. Sitting in the audience tonight is my dean, who last Thursday called to the stage during graduation to give the annual award for perfect attendance for three years. It's an award that one or two, maybe three people can accomplish. And uh, Chuck Waters gave out 18 perfect attendance awards for three years. <laughs> 18 students who didn't miss a single day for three years. Could I have another slide, please? Here you will see the trends of our suspensions. We used to have one of the highest suspension rates in the district. Now we have one of the lowest. 
even compared to all the other middle schools. So you can see that something is going on at Visitation Valley. Next slide, please. Our GPA has trended up consistently since the start of Quiet Time. When we started Quiet Time, almost none of our graduates went to Lowell High School. I'm sure there's some Lowell graduates in the audience tonight who will let you know that it is one of the prestigious uh, high schools at all of San Francisco, if not west of the Mississippi. This year, we set a record of sending 19 eighth grade students to Lowell High School. <laughs> Out of a class of 115, we are also sending our students to other schools in the, in the system as well. Next slide, please. In our first year, we had an eighth grade as a control group. This enabled us to do some rigorous analysis to see if Quiet Time program had an impact on STAR test scores. We compared the controls as to Quiet Time students and found that Quiet Time students' scores were significantly higher. The biggest shift was with the lowest performing groups, the below basic and far below basic that you see here. And last year, our overall STAR test scores went up 40 points, the highest increase in any of the middle schools in San Francisco, and double-digit improvement for all ethnic groups. All of this indicates that we are winning the battle against the predictive power of demographics. Our kids are coming to school. They are more motivated, more confident, more focused, more successful, and more joyful. Our teacher turnover and absenteeism is almost zero. And for me, perhaps most important, my students, teachers, and parents are really happy and joyful. Six years ago, at our eighth grade graduation, I spent most of my time breaking up fights, not only between students, but between parents. Last Thursday, we had a marvelous, peaceful, uplifting graduation. One of our students who, in the sixth grade, was one of the most troubled, disruptive students in the school, requested and performed a musical composition at the end of the performance, he came up to me and gave me a hug. He thanked me and told me he loved the school. This is symbolic of the transformation we have experienced at Visitation Valley Middle School. Thank you. David started this foundation, launched it July 25th, 2005. It was an idea to bring meditation to any child in the country that wanted it. Six years later, you hear this presentation and the unbelievable work that's been done here in the San Francisco Unified School District with the unbelievable leadership of Dr. Carlos Garcia. What is your experience tonight? Um, I, I always said that um, first it started up here at the Visitation Valley High, uh, Middle School and that Jim Durkee here is a hero. As he said, he had to go downtown and tell them that he wanted to bring um, Transcendental Meditation Quiet Time program to his school. Meditation, um, as you all know, um, uh, nutcakes, you know, meditate. We weirdos meditate. Uh, serious people um, don't necessarily meditate. And you don't have meditation in school. All kinds of misunderstandings about meditation. All kinds of misunderstandings about transcendental meditation. And uh, yet there it was. Jim Durkee got it for his school, his students, his teachers, his staff. And they went to work, and Laurent and his team um, went to work with them. 
and five years later, you've heard the success. This thing, there is a treasury within every human being, a treasury. And transcendental meditation is just a mental technique to take a person within, this dive within is so beautiful, so profoundly beautiful, and it brings so much of a transformation. Stress goes, and all this gold, intelligence, creativity, love, happiness, energy comes, uh, and it's, it's, it's so beautiful, so beautiful. And this happiness, you can see it on their faces, the kids in the, in the films, go visit their schools, it's really amazing. I want all these kids to come uh, work with me. They're just so fantastic. It's really, really beautiful what's going on. So as, as Superintendent Garcia said, please support this. It's, it's the future. It's no longer a weird thing. It's getting to the point where it'll be very weird not to meditate. People often ask, now we're shifting gears, <clears throat> why you started meditating. I started meditating. I uh, heard a phrase, true happiness is not out there. True happiness lies within. And I felt a truth to this phrase. But the phrase doesn't tell you where the within is, nor does it tell you how to get there. So it's a very frustrating phrase. And I was working on my first feature film. I had a, the greatest, greatest setup. I was accepted to a school in a 55-room mansion in the best part of Beverly Hills, California, and I had taken over the stables down below. So many rooms, all mine, all the equipment to work with, all mine, all of so, the crew to work with me. And it, I thought I should be the happiest person in the world. And I looked inside, and it was just a surface thing. Hollow inside, really deep happiness wasn't there. And I said, I got to do something about this. And I started looking into meditation. And I ran into a couple people tonight when they first came in, and they started, we started talking about meditation. Meditation is there's so many different kinds. If you're going to spend the time to meditate, Pick one that works. <laughs> Please do that. And you could go try all these different things. And a part of me wants to recommend that you go try all the different ones and then come try Transcendental Meditation, because then you'll see the difference. I didn't try all these other ones, but I've heard so many stories of people who did and then came to Transcendental Meditation. It's such a, a difference. It's a unique form of meditation. It's so easy and effortless, but that's part of the thing of just sliding in and transcending and boom, you go. I, my sister called me, said she'd started Transcendental Meditation. I liked what she told me compared to all the other things I heard from other for forms of meditation. I went down and I learned. And as I said, my first meditation, the teacher said, you'll sit in here, sit comfortably in a chair, close your eyes and start that mantra that was, you were given and away you go. So she said, I'll be back in 20 minutes. I sat comfortably, closed my eyes, started that mantra and boom, as I said, I thought I was in an elevator and they cut the cables. <laughs> Down within I went and it was so beautiful, so profoundly beautiful. I said, where has this experience been? And it's just, it's, it's, it is um, it's life transforming. I was filled with anger. I didn't have this happiness. And within a couple of weeks, this anger lifted away. My first wife came to me and said, what's going on? And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, this anger, because I was taking it all out on her. She said, this anger, where did it go? So it's, it's um, things just get getting better and better, and I've been meditating twice a day for almost 38 years now. David has to catch a plane to go back down to Los Angeles this evening, the last flight. Any final comments? Message, comments?
this, this thing of happiness within is a real thing. And it's, it's, imagine if meditation was very, very difficult. How would kids, you know, do it? You could get transcendental meditation when you're 10 years old. A 10-year-old can do it. If it was very, very difficult, it wouldn't work in schools. It wouldn't work. People wouldn't do it. And, and uh, it's, it's um, supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be easy to dive within, transcend, experience that ocean of pure happiness. And every time you dive within and transcend and experience that, you infuse some and you grow in that happiness. You grow in intelligence. It's an ocean of pure intelligence, pure creativity, pure love, pure energy, pure power, pure peace within every human being. And this happiness comes. And you see these faces of students. They were so stressed. They were not happy at all. And you can paint the schools pretty colors, you can give them new books, you can do all these different things, but it's not going to address those torments inside those kids. It's not going to get there. It's not going to clean the machine. You give them this technique, and they know it. They feel it. And real happiness comes. And they feel that and it changes their life. It's so beautiful. Give it to the kids. Thank you very, very much. I'm gonna go now. Okay. David Lynch gives credit to everybody else, but the fact of the matter is six years ago, he gave his name, a lot of his own resources, He's traveled the world, speaking to colleges all over the world, enormous numbers of press interviews, written a book, making films, just to do this one thing, to bring meditation, stress-reducing, evidence-based meditation to any child anywhere in the world who wants to meditate. David Lynch, thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you very much, everybody here. Thank you, Bobby. Do you want to introduce John? Oh, uh, no, you do. You, you, you. Okay, okay. We have finally. Oh, yeah. I was going to introduce you better. Do you want that? No. Okay. Can't see you. I'm sure you the wonderful. The wonderful, the substance behind what David is talking about is the fact that all these transformations, what takes place in meditation, is not just theory, it's not just philosophy, it's not just wishful thinking. It's a transformation in the way the brain functions, it's a transformation in the way the heart functions, respiratory system functions, nervous system functions. I wanted to go right, John, to a question on the brain first. There's a lot of research that have been done on meditation in the brain, and in particular, I know on transcendental meditation in the brain. Could you please explain how these transformations that Laurent and Jamie and everybody, Noah and Vidya and all these wonderful people have been bringing about through teaching meditation, how is it based in what's going on in the brain? Well, the whole thing is brain-based. I think you could say life is brain-based. And what happens with meditation is that you start to bring more of the brain, more of the total potential of the brain, to everything you do. What you find as a result of this process, the meditative state, what happens is our normally outwardly directed attention, which is very localized and very specific, starts to relax and diffuse and become more expanded. And the meditative state is a state of maximum expansion, universal awareness pure consciousness. That state is unique, not waking, dreaming, sleeping, hypnosis. It engages the total brain. It's called global EEG coherence. The whole brain is functioning in coherence, in synchrony. And after meditation, more of that total brain functioning is brought to bear on whatever we do. 
So there are a million exercises, a million meditations, a million subjects you can study that exercise this or that competency, the brain. Transcendental meditation goes beyond thinking altogether to the experience of pure awareness. And it actually enlivens the core content of life, pure life, pure awareness. It's like turning up the dial of consciousness. You have more life, more consciousness, more awareness to bring to anyone, anything. And that shows up as utilizing more and more of the total potential of the brain. It's very striking to see it. The transformation is total. The difference between the meditative state, unbounded awareness, and anything else is striking. And that becomes more and more stabilized. And of course, as a result of using more of the brain, IQ, creativity, learning ability, academic performance, moral reasoning, all improve. That's just because the amount of awareness, amount of life we have to bring to anything is increasing. That's what it means to go beyond thought and enliven the ocean of consciousness at the source of thought. So two last questions. Prefrontal cortex, talk about what, happen, what the prefrontal cortex is and what happens with meditation. Very important. This is the so-called higher brain, prefrontal cortex, executive center. It's called the higher brain because it sits over the rest of the brain, the reactive brain, primitive brain, and it's our rational filter against primitive, aggressive, impulsive, violent behavior. The problem is, under stress, the prefrontal cortex shuts down, as it's designed to. If somebody takes a swing at you, you need to duck. You need to duck instinctively. It's not the time to philosophize about it. <laughs> but under chronic stress, the prefrontal cortex, higher brain, shuts down chronically and fails to develop properly. And as a result of that, and if it doesn't develop, higher brain, by the age of 25, it doesn't develop further at all. So you could say we're living in a society, a stress society, of uh, incomplete development of the higher brain. And if you turn on the TV, you look at a reality TV show, look what's happening in the news, you think, yeah, we are stuck in an adolescent world. And the problem is areas of the world and areas of our country that are under more stress, there you see this underdevelopment of the critical higher brain. You see it in prisons. One of the amazing things about TM in a prison setting, this research going on now in Oregon and Ohio, and throughout the years, is that the meditative state engages the total brain. It enlivens the prefrontal cortex. It integrates it with the rest of the brain. It ex restores executive control. The bottom line is, people who are released from prison don't go back to prison. And there are two million people in our prisons, maximum security prisons, who are stuck in that system forever. And the reason is there's nothing we teach or offer in the prisons that actually rehabilitates somebody at the core level, actually restores balance functioning to the brain. So even that, by breaking that cycle of release and rehabilitation and then reincarceration, by providing something, a tool anyone can have, that they can take with them throughout life and combat the negative effects of stress on brain functioning, will prevent so much crime. Most of crime is, is you know, by repeat offenders. As an educator, I'm more interested in prevention than cure. And it is a much, much better thing to give our young people a tool to ensure the proper full development of the brain, keep them out of the prison system to begin with, and really allow people to accomplish the incredible aspirations we all have but aren't always given the tools to accomplish. Usually when one interviews someone, they introduce who he is at the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. John Hagelin, I was so entranced and you came <laughs> bopping out so fast. Um, Dr. John Hagelin is a Harvard-trained quantum physicist. He's the president of the David Lynch Foundation. He um, has spent years of research at CERN and at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. He uh, also directs the Institute for um, Science, Technology, and Public Policy. He's an outstanding exponent of meditation in general, research on meditation, and has really been guiding with David Lynch the expansion of the David Lynch Foundation all over the world. So now we'll start with our first question again. No. <laughs> I have one last question. <laughs> His wife, Cara, is also happy. Um, tell me a little bit, and I'll just say what the rest of the evening will be, 
have this last question for John, then we have some beautiful music by one of the, a senior from um, Burton High School, and then we're going to meet, they're gonna come up on stage just for a moment, all of the quiet time teachers from the schools, and then we're gonna end with a beautiful two minute video of kids meditating from all over the world. So the last question for you, Dr. John Hagelin, president of the David Lynch Foundation. <laughs> Tell me a little bit, we've looked here at what David's foundation is doing in San Francisco, extraordinary. This is very successful, one of many different projects. Tell me some of the different areas that the foundation is involved in. This is such an exciting foundation, such an incredible job. You've heard about the schools, <clears throat> 150,000 students in 24 countries, but there are programs for veterans that are vitally important. So many, a third of our veterans come back ravaged by PTSD. Everybody's very concerned that something be done, but nothing is working. We need and we're starting to use an approach that will really restore, relieve the extremely deep-seated stress, the ravages of war stress, and restore normalcy to the brain. So we're doing research in collaboration with the VA hospitals and leading VA research centers. As we just heard, a published, very important published paper just came out by our esteemed Dr. Norman Rosenthal in military medicine showing about a 50% reduction in the symptoms of PTSD in about eight weeks of regular practice of transcendental meditation. So veterans is big, homeless. Incredible to give the homeless a tool that will prevent them from using or abusing uh, drugs, alcohol, drugs and alcohol will really give them the tools to re-enter society and contribute productively to society. We have an incredible program in Los Angeles, Children of the Night, working with a program that provides shelter and security and education to children, girls victimized by prostitution. Now also meditation. And that really has been the missing tool to provide the healing of brain and physiology from the severe trauma that they've had. Prisons we've already spoken about. <clears throat> Native Americans, it's a population subject to huge stress, diabetes, suicide, depression, drug dependence. We're working very closely with leading American, Native American organizations in the U.S. to bring the TM technique to the Native American peoples and the relief and the transformation there is unbelievable. So wherever we go with this marvelously, ridiculously simple solution, because it is, the practice of it is almost ridiculously simple. You just say, my God, it's right underneath my nose, and I've never experienced myself, my own consciousness, my own awareness, and how transformative that is, how deeply blissful that experience is. It's so easy, and it's just kind of ridiculous. A historical fluke that it is not part of education, Know thyself is supposed to be the foundation of personal development education. There's no self in education today. Nobody even knows consciousness exists because the problem with waking consciousness is you're aware of everything but consciousness. That's the kind of, that's the tragedy of waking consciousness. If pure consciousness is just that, pure consciousness, and it gets infused into waking consciousness, and from that point, with the light of life turned up, everything goes better and better and better. So I just wanted to add, stop by saying, you've heard enough tonight. Read Norman's book. It's really an absolutely marvelous read by really one of the top, maybe the top psychiatrist, most respected in the country, in his experience using it with his patients. And if you're not meditating yet, you probably will be by the time you finish that book. That's a very good first step. And once you've had that sweet taste, be sure and help the others in this group who've been so generous bringing this program to the children of this area, which is leading the world, absolutely a shining light, a model of this profound enrichment to education that the whole world is starting to follow. So let San Francisco continue to shine more and more and let all the children of this incredible city in this area benefit from the incredible God-given potential that everybody possesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hagelin. We conclude with a few musical interludes. First, with Patrick Tagaloa, who's a student at Burton High School. 
Patrick learned to meditate at Visitation Valley Middle, Middle School four years ago, and he's going to sing a song played with music by Suzanne um, that was made famous by uh, some supporters of the Quiet Time program many years ago. Please welcome Patrick Tagalo. Hi. <laughs> When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing there in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And a round of applause for my pianist, uh, Suzanne Garamoni. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Paul would be proud. I'd now like to invite the teachers of the Quiet Time program in the four schools in the San Francisco Unified School District 
who are in the schools every day from 7.30 in the morning throughout the day, providing guidance on meditation, but also becoming big brothers and big sisters. Would you please welcome many of the teachers of the Quiet Time program. Could you please come out? <laughs> <laughs>